And, and she says, Oh, guess guess who's playing Pippin in Lord of the Rings? <laughs> <laughs> and I was it's like, not you. <laughs> it's not you. <laughs> you didn't get really it. mean phone call. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hola, mis amigos. You're listening to Oh My God, Hi, Hijo de Dios. Hola. With me, George Lopez, porque sabe que let's do the show porque está calado. Let's do the thing. I gotta go to that dry cleaner. I my kid fell. Se pegó la cabeza. I gotta go get some Neo Spore Spore and Paul. You know what George is? Oh, I'm sure he's around here somewhere. What's his name? George Lopez. George Lopez. Oh my God. OMG. OMG. Hi. Oh my God. Hi. What makes it more dicey is there's a small house. That's connected to a driveway to the Tate LaBianca, the LaBiancas that were killed by Charles Manson's gang. And Charles Manson was in the home that night wow. with a connective driveway. Right. Dude, that's and that, that fountain at the junction of Los Feliz Boulevard and what is that junction? Where, Riverside. Where, yeah, Riverside. So that's where they came down and washed their hands and feet oh. after the murder, right? Oh, no way. They did. Yeah, a friend of mine told me that. They come down from that hill... And the closest water source is that huge fountain, which is still there, and they wash their hands and feet. Yeah, what are you fountain. doing where you're at? You're, you're missing all the... Oh, that's so dark. Just Nothing walk through the dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just up and down. In Brentwood, they had the mezzaluna. <laughs> the guy left it, the girl left her, the mom left her sunglasses, and the waiter <laughs> said, hey, I'll take them. And he's walking up with the sunglasses, yeah. and then... Post better on next door app. <laughs> the lady, yeah, the lady saw OJ run a red light, and look at her and give her a menacing look. She sold her story to hard copy. She was out. Right. Can't be a witness if you sell your story to hard copy. Right. That was so on she Bund was Bundy, out. right? On yeah, Bundy. on Bundy. Have you met OJ? Yes. How's that? Oh, let's start there, yeah. I played golf with OJ. Oh, really? After he was acquitted. So you spent some time with him? He, he was playing at Norwood, which is in Granada Hills, and he was playing at Handsome Down, which is in the Valley. But OJ played at the AT&T. He played at Riviera Country Club over there in Pacific Palisades. They play the LA Open there. So OJ was used to kind of playing anywhere OJ wanted to play. Sure. Mm -hmm. So then after he was acquitted, Nangrada got kicked out of, you know, Riviera. Nobody would play with him. Then he started to play in the Valley at Nowood and Granada Hills on Balboa near uh, Rinaldi. And then he played at Handsome Dam, which is on the fifth hole right over the fence is where Rodney King got beat by the LAPD. Wow. Right there, and the guy George Holloway or Holiday had bought a camera that day. This is how it all started. Mm -hmm. He bought a camera that day when people started to buy their own personal cameras. Mm -hmm. Right. So he buys it, and then he opens the box, plugs it in. Then he takes it out on his balcony and says, "Let me see how to, how I work this thing." And what he catches is the end of the chase. Damn. And then he's videotaping the beating, and he can't believe what he has. And he calls the Foothill Division of the LAPD, which is the Foothill Division. They, they were the jurisdiction of when I was growing up, and they they were had a reputation of being of being hard asses. Right. And George Holloway calls and says, "Hey, has anybody recorded any issues of police brutality tonight?" And the desk commander says, "You know, no, but you know, it'd be nice if you would mind your own business." <laughs> yeah. So he hangs up, and his next call is to Channel 5 Damn. and says, I have this video. And they said, hey, bring it in. And then they see it, and then it's it's on Channel 5, and it changes the way that we look at yeah. police work yeah. and videotapes. Yeah. Changed the world in a lot of ways. And just one guy who brought home a camcorder. And just charged it and said, let me... let me go out on my balcony and see. Well, that's gnarly, man. That's gnarly. Yeah. Is he still with us, Rodney King? No. He died, right? He drowned. I, he drowned. He drowned. Yeah. And he had some significant health problems post the attack, right? But he, what, you just went swimming one day? And I, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'd like to think it's more than just that. I mean, oh, I go swimming. Damn. I don't, you know, so he... Wow. You know, that's crazy. I think, you know, and it's, and it's interesting because, you know, a guy like Rodney King was... First of all, I mean, all of the things around that were like the Hyundai was going 115. I'm not sure if Hyundai, you know... When they found out, they said, how fast did it go? Yeah. <laughs> it's a Hyundai. It's that's a Hyundai. A P, that's a PR. It's a, hey, I mean, you know, we never, I don't think we ever got it up past 90, but, you know. But, but it's help. so much of it became what is, what has evolved today. Like, you know, they moved the trial out of Los Angeles to Simi Valley, and Simi Valley was more of a 
was not LA, so so the jury I think was more of a one-sided thing. But you know, it changed. That was ninety. That was almost thirty years ago. Right. Oh wow. So, but that's not why we're here. I mean, no. but it is, it is good. Yeah, <laughs> hey, well, let's, so let's I mean, chat. Yeah, we should, we should do intros. In, yeah, yeah, intros. intros. Uh, very excited to have on uh, to the podcast today. We have Billy Boyd, Dominic Monaghan. Uh, Hello. It's yes. Monahan, but that's Mon- all right. Monahan. It's all right. It's all right. I have I have a name that people get wrong. It's just, <laughs> uh, well, well, and well, I was Monahan last is almost edition. like, um, you know, if you had the you know the butter, Pat Monahan from Train. Right. Right. I don't think they ever say Monic. What did you say? Monic- 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 it's all right. There is a G Monic- in there, but it's it's. Ah. Uh, I could have taken it out, mm. but then I think there's another actor called Dominic Monaghan with the with the G taken out. There's a. Was oh, it like SAG rules? Or yeah, something like you that? can't in yeah. in in Britain. You can't have you can't have the same name, can you? That's true. Was there a William Boyd? There was a William Boyd when I came out of drama school. Interesting. There was a William Boyd working in the UK. He was on a show called EastEnders. Right. Okay. Big, was a show. big show. It's Very big say. show. And he was like the bad guy on EastEnders. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to have to change my name. So I was going back to my mother's maiden name. And there was somebody there. And Which I, is what? Uh, Manly. So it was going to be William Manly. William Manly. Quite oh, cool. Like but there was name. somebody, William Manly. So then I went to my uh, dad's. Or, uh, way back and then there was a Strachan in there so it was going to be William Strachan but then William Boyd in EastEnders died no <laughs> he, <laughs> he forgot to pay his union dues oh wow oh no way <laughs> I took the name boom you're in oh sniped brilliant okay you know I know he said there's from the show Extras but EastEnders was a Grant fabric yeah, yeah. What, what would it, what's the equivalent of EastEnders in the United States is there one? Um, well, it's it is the big... I like that, too, it, is there one? Which is, which is a bit of, you know, whenever they say it, it doesn't sound as insulting. You know, yeah. it's not. Is there one? In England, <laughs> or in... Or could in, there ever be? <laughs> in, in, in England, I mean, we're not including Scotland here, because Scotland had Crossroads, which is their own soap opera, uh, right? Uh, take the high road. Take the high road. But in England, the two big warring soap operas for the past 50 years, well, 40 years, because East End has not been around Whoa. for that long. Yeah was Coronation Street out of Manchester when I'm where I'm from right. and EastEnders out of London where you know m- most other people and certainly <laughs> Londoners are from. <laughs> yeah. EastEnders tends to be a little bit rougher around the edges right? Yeah, yeah. They deal with drugs and stabbings and stuff and in Coronation Street someone's lost a dog and a cat's gone up a tree and someone's fallen into oh. a, a well which is another show similar to that. And Ian McKellen who plays Gandalf in Lord of the Rings loves uh, Coronation Street and actually went and played in it as a character after Lord of the Rings. He, oh, really? He did a couple of months as a character because oh. he loves it so and, much. And also his mum. His mum was a massive fan. Ah, right. And I'm not sure if his mum's still with us. I think she was. The last time I spoke to him, his mum is very old. And she's a huge Coronation Street fan, so we said, I'll go do that. You've had some big actors in Coronation Street. Tom Courtney was in Coronation Street, who was a massive actor in the, in the 60s. In EastEnders, who's the big breakout characters from East Enders. So I'm going to say that no I, one you guys I, I'm going to apologize because there is no show like those two shows in the United States. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Well, just, like The Young and the Restless, is that not uh, no? It's uh, I mean General Hospital, I guess it just I feel like there's so so much more clout to like an East Enders or, or even a Coronation Street or <laughs> yeah, something like right, that. Yeah, right, like, right. But you know, that's kind of being old, you know, there was Edge of Night like that was but they ran its course, you know, right. and as the world turns What's the biggest telenovela of all time? Um, oh, I got, I got nothing. I there's a lot of them. But the, the, I got. Is it. there not like a benchmark yeah. thing that's like that is the king and everything else gets out of the way? You know, if my grandmother hadn't passed, I probably would be able to tell you because it was always on in the other room. So yeah, yeah. Really <laughs> <laughs> yeah, George, stay with that. But it's gone on. Yeah, it's gone on. It's Gun, gone on. Gunsmoke was on for like 25 years. Yeah, oh, <laughs> right. The Simpsons yeah, is a yeah. different piece, Sabalo, but that's got another the, empire. Yeah, Simpsons. Yeah. I do remember there was a point where The Simpsons was the best show on television and the most dangerous show on television, oh, yeah. and now it's a little passe, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think you know if you look at Family Guy mm. and American Dad, mm. where in animation you're able to get away with quite a bit more yeah, yeah. but it doesn't mean that it's l- less edgy yeah i don't think you could do it in in a human body but you can do it as a as an animation yeah, yeah. And then it's a they no, get it's away all. with i was watching murder, love and drugs everything yeah. do you guys yeah. know love and death and robots or uh, love death and robots yes i, I was just watching one so of it's kind of, of yeah. short form animations some somewhere between 
12, 15, 20 minutes. David Finch is involved. Robert Rodriguez is involved. The animation is incredible, but they deal with quite edgy stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's yeah. death and there's murder and, you know, it's, it's kind of how do humans deal with technology in a modern day world? It's fantastic. It's on Netflix. Fantastic. Oh, I, have you heard of that, Billy? George, um, <laughs> before I go into that, because I haven't, <laughs> I, so the reason we're here is to try your beer, right? Thank, but I'm only no, on on. Hold on. Hold on. on. Hold on. Is there a cold one? I don't you got know. more. So we have co yeah, co more Are you going for the same one as me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Here, it's a good. It's hop. It's I'll a little hoppy, but it's good. More. You like hops, though, don't you? I do. I, it's I a little do. hoppy. Hold I on. like it. This is and great. This is, cheers, mate. Well, it's got a good noise to it. Last time I saw... Cheers, Joe. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Huge fans of yours. This, Billy, is, this is kind of an on, like, by the pool type beer, like yes, an afternoon absolutely. type beer. Absolutely, yes. How long have you been uh, drinking We've been beer? brewing for about a year, and then the restaurant opened in Hermosa about a month ago, and then I got a place in Torrance called... What's the restaurant Bruce called? Hall. It's Bruce it, Hall. Oh, it's fantastic. Like it? Yeah, thank you. We've it's got to take really a drive good. to the restaurant. Isn't that great? I was down in Torrance the other day. I should have went in. There's and this one, time. this one is hibiscus, it's a little sour, but oh, I love it. what they started to do with this mm. is starting to put a little bit of tequila on the rocks and then using this, Ooh. almost like someone would use Red Bull with vodka, and it works that Tequila's way. Tequila's my jam. If, I, if, oh. someone's, if someone put a gun to my head and said, you have to drink one drink for the rest of your life, tequila, <laughs> oh my absolutely. God, God bless you. Alcohol. What, what do they do with tequila in that? What, they, they, they use it almost like, you know, as a, like a mixer, a, as a mixer as a mixer to the... Uh, La Familia, some ice, and this on top, and it, That's it's great. beautiful. You have to take some. I'll give you some of this to try. Oh, that'd be great. Now, so you're, you're a beer fan, George. This is something yeah, that you've been into. Absolutely. Have you, the, have you... the, these aren't cold, but that one. This one's cold? This is that cold. That one's not cold, yeah, but the ones we have are cold. Yeah, these, those, those are I will give you the take. So and that one reminds too, yeah. me of a dream sickle, the 50 50 bar. Yes. When you were yes. growing up, that has orange on the outside and cream in the middle. Right, right. That was That's the what, genesis behind that. Something for your son to try. <laughs> this, <laughs> <laughs> As per FCC rules, that's uh, not a legal recommendation. <laughs> have, you, have you partaken of any British beers, Joe? Uh, I was drinking Tenants uh, quite a bit. Tenants? That's I classic I Scottish you been beer. drinking Tenants? Uh, I didn't realize that I heard on a show somewhere it's almost like drinking you know complete lead but yeah. <laughs> uh when i went back to scotland they didn't have it at well st andrews has changed quite a bit st andrews has gone from as a golfer st andrews went from kind of the home of golf sure to a destination around the home of golf okay where the quaint places like the jigger in on 17 now you go in there everybody's a bit younger and they're all wearing the same shirt so it went from kind of the place where every time you went, you saw the same person to more of a upscale. Right. And then the place seemed more of a, almost like Cabo, where right. everything is kind of a resort around. They built uh, a new Four yeah, Seasons yeah, down by the, by the new course. Right. And then now it's, it's not, you won't get lost in there anymore. Right. Because it just became... Place where now it's a destination of golf. When yeah. was the first time you played St Andrews? The first time I played St Andrews was 2008. And what is it? The greatest golf course, or is that just based on tradition? It's the home of golf. So it's the tradition of it, it's or is it a great? It's a great it. course, it's a great, and it's still a great course as well. Yes, it's a hard course. That's what makes it it's so very great. Difficult, yes, and the gorse, which we don't have gorse. Like I remember, gorse, Ernie, I was in, gorse. the gorse is just this. Uh, there's, plant. It's a plant that's sticky. And it's, well, it's the golf plant, you, and you can't no, stick it's your a no. It's like a, plant. Okay, course, I was yeah. like, oh, this is something it's a golf like in the rough or whatever. That's like in the rough. Like, and I remember yeah. Ernie Els, his ball got caught in the gorse, but it was like waist high. So he said, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit it like swinging a baseball because he he didn't move it. I mean, you could play it, <laughs> yeah. and he swung at it like waist high, like like hitting. Was it out. like a heather? Well, it's like no, because no, heather thick, thick, sticky, sticky. Yeah, yeah. it's not a rough. good oh, yeah. wow. sticky. You wouldn't want to fall into it. So that's part of the character of St. Andrews. Yeah. Plus you get the wind blowing. The wind and the rain and the conditions. So people who are playing over here are used to hitting these lovely big shots and then, but you get to St. Andrews, you had it up there as a way over yeah. there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. You get, yeah. And then on that on the beach there, they, they they filmed Chariots of Fire. So they're running on the beach. They're wow. running on that, that yeah. on that beach right there. And and so, uh, go on, Bill. And it was, uh, St. Andrews was the first job I got out of um, drama school. Uh, St Andrews used to have a, a rep theatre, repertory oh, theatre, oh. where you would go there 
for you know the six month whatever it was and you would do a play at night rehearse another one during the day it would run for a couple of weeks then you do the next play and it's still one of my favourite jobs brilliant just doing a play at night rehearsing going to those wonderful bars around St Andrews yeah. playing some golf oh Brilliant. And is there, a, is there a particular hole at St. Andrews that is kind of the, the one that people talk about? Well, the 18th about? hole is the one where there's, you know, there, people stand and watch every day. But 17th, the, the road hole is the one that is right up against the St. Andrews uh, Hotel there. So the professionals, because they're a little bit further back, they have, they have to hit it over the hotel. Wow. <laughs> And then it comes up on the other side. So they would say, aim Ultimate. towards, you know, the corner of this. Now, when I played there, I hit it into a wedding reception up on top. <laughs> and, then I, and then I went in there and looked at the dent on the side. And I bought the, the bride and grew a bottle of dumb. Oh, nice. it, went, it went rifling through their their their, their party. You could have killed someone, Joe. I could have yeah. killed someone. <laughs> And I went in there and said, uh, you know, I apologize. I'd like to buy you guys a right. bottle of champagne. That's, That's brilliant. <laughs> Didn't I read something that Tiger Woods had only ever played there during, you know, huge championships? And and he knew where he, to aim, where he hit the ball because of where the cameras and everything were. All wow. the, So when he played there without all that, he didn't know how to play the course because he's like, oh, wow, I normally aim for it. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. One of the most amazing things is uh, of, of any golfer is that Tiger Woods won the British Open in 2000. And they have, every golfer has a guy in the group that carries a rake, and if you hit it in the trap, he'll rake the trap and he'll continue with you. And in 2000, Tiger won the British Open at St. Andrews and did not hit it in the trap once. Wow. And that's impossible. That's legend. Wow. Sure. Have you played with Tiger? Uh, you know, I met Tiger in 1997, in February, the LA Open was in town. I met him at the Laugh Factory. Pr still pretty nice enough guy. And then he won the Masters in April. And then I've seen him around a little bit. But, you know, I think everybody knows how difficult it is to be a person, I guess, of that. Yeah. Right. That yeah. Iconic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Where I could say alleged. I mean, Michael Jordan and Charles Barkley were friends of his. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when a guy is trying to be maybe cool... I don't think you use Charles Barkley and Michael Jordan as your yard markers because basketball fame is different than golf fame, yeah. but also Tiger was a bit of an introvert and a bit of of, of a not a ladies' man per se. Right, right. So I think right. he, he got a little bit over, over his head. Right. Because I remember uh, Charles saying, alleged, you know, do, do you, don't try to do us. Right. We're... We're pros, right, right. and we're in a different business. They are You're literally a, bowlers. They're, yeah, they're bowlers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's in a business where they tell everybody to be quiet, and Jordan and Barkley are a business where like, when you get got the up. ball, they tell you to do <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah. They're banging, bugging rubber things together <laughs> and trying to get you to, to miss right. the shot. But but it definitely you could see where... Did, did you see the HBO doc about yeah. yes. Tiger? I mean, obviously the Best. shadow of his father looms very large mm -hmm. in his life, right? And I think the passing of his father probably sent him into a tailspin. Right. And then he's got all of these distractions with money and women and his incredible talent. You know, he's a fascinating guy. It's, a fa it's sure. fascinating. Yeah. He, he, even when we were talking about last time that even what happened to him here with no breaks and no skid marks right. is a bit of, I think almost, you'd hate to think that, you know, because the, in there it starts, the second part starts with him getting pulled over mm -hmm. and he didn't know where he was. Yeah. And then, totally and then earlier this year he gets in an accident and he, and he kind of doesn't remember that, kind of didn't know where he was. Right. So it could be alleged, you know, it's like prescription drugs, but it's a, it becomes a real issue. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's lived in pain for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. Th that footage of him hitting that was drives nice. and his knee falling oh, out of you place. You like, hear the bones Yeah, crack. they were saying yeah. that the, the people close to him said they could hear a crunch of like, <clears throat> as his knee falls I, out. I saw and, Charles Barkley at a Laker game the end of April of 2008. And then I said, you talked to Tiger because he had had just surgery. And, Tiger, and Charles said, that fucking guy's going to play in the U.S. Open on a broken leg. I said, hey, man, there's no reason for you to play. And he's like, fuck that. I think I can win. And he won. I mean, right. he won on the Monday. Crazy. But then yeah. another, it's not like the, the U.S. Open isn't like where you play three holes and then, you know, you, you decide a winner. If you're tie on Sunday, you have to come back the next day and play all 18 holes. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you might, you know, win on the second playoff hole. Mm, yeah. But... 
I'm fascinated by pro athletes. I'm a huge football fan, and you know, I like I like any uh, like high element of sport, the Olympics, NBA. You know, a, a, any any sport where you have the best of the best, I'm always yeah. interested in that. But what's what's the fascinating thing that I watch as an outsider looking in is the mentality stays the same with all of these guys, but their body eventually fails. So you're watching oh. someone who thinks, I can do that. I used to be able to do that. And you've got this crazy battle going on where their body goes, we can't do it anymore. So with Tiger for the longest time, it seems like he said, I'm just going to have my force of will take over. And then eventually his knees and his hips are just like, Tiger, like, we, yeah. we can't yeah. keep you going. You can't you know? think yourself new cartilage. I, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And he might have already been, been you know, a few surgeries in, even by the time he got out of high school. But did you see the Maradona docu of documentary on HBO? Of course. Genius. You, you're a football fan, obviously, yeah. South America. So yeah. what, where... You, you well, support Mexico? Out, out here, no, from Mexico, yeah. And, and So the Mexican national team you yeah. support, but what about a city team or? Um, you know, I'd say, you know, I'm an LA Aztec. They were around yeah. in the 80s. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Galaxy, you know, so LAFC. I, oh, I used, to go to, the, yeah. I used to go to the Rose Bowl and see the Aztecs play, and you're just amazed that they're running around for that whole time. Maybe the, in a minute or two, this guy wasn't in there. And and then you realize the beauty of what, a, it's a world game. Yeah. yeah. I don't, you know, they say Beautiful. World Series, they say, you know, the, the Super Bowl, but it's nothing like... No, the World Cup the, eclipses. The World Cup, yeah. 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 My, my, tr my trainer, who I've, who I've been training with for like 20 years now, is a big athlete, played basketball at school, played baseball, liked soccer but never really played it. And we, we, I've known him for 20 years. And over that, over that time, I said to him, because I'm always referencing Messi, because Messi's like on some genius oh, yeah, level, yeah. Jordan, yeah. Tiger Woods level. Yeah. And I said... It, just watch one thing that Messi does and try and replicate it. Like, run as fast as you possibly can and bring a soccer ball with you. It is impossible. <laughs> yeah. let, let, let alone all of the tricks and the movement yeah. and, and the, the changes of direction. And we went out to a park one day and I just said, just try that. Kick the ball in front of you and try and sprint and keep the ball with you. And he was like, I don't understand. And I'm like, no one understands Messi. No, no one understands yeah. Maradona or Cruyff or all those people. Maradona would mm -hmm. kick it with the leg between his other leg right, and right. under and uh -huh. make a goal. Yeah. Or even his penalty kick where he didn't even think about it. He walked up yeah. and in one movement hit it and made it in above the net in the corner yeah. and without even thinking of it. So what, as the goalie, you're standing there and you don't even get a chance to do this because he's just he's just you know leisurely going up, up right. and it's over. You can't and you can't get it. When he was like 12, 13, get, like Boca Juniors were like circling around him, getting mm -hmm. ready to sign him and giving him money, obviously keeping him on the books. They would Boca Juniors would bring Maradona on at halftime, and he would juggle the ball with a golf ball. He would do keepy ups, and then with a glass <laughs> Coca Cola bottle, he what? would yeah. do keepy ups yeah. onto his knee. Onto his chest, down onto his knee again. Like, oh, what that's, that's are you crazy. talking about? That's just trans. He's genius. How does that? Um, you know, do you think people? Do you think people are aware in their in their time of, like, I'm. You know, I turned sixty, so I would say from maybe twenty to fifty, of all the things that I saw that were great, a lot of them athletes are, uh, and and because of maybe social media and. and Somebody's good and somebody's good, but there's always somebody that's really great. You think people really understand the genius of some of these people if they're not athletes or actors or? No, I always feel like there's, you know, until you do something, you don't know what you don't know. Mm. And so, like, you can see someone like like Messi or Ronaldo or something like that, and they do something insane, and you're like, wow, that's crazy. But to your point, it's like you take someone out, and you're like, try doing one of those things. Right. Try running. And once you learn, like, how hard it actually is, then yeah. you even you understand even better. Like, once you start playing guitar, then you realize how hard that solo was. Right. And I'm yeah. also fascinated with the, you know, the Rory McIlroys or, or the... The Scotty Pippins or the Cristiano Ronaldos who have spent their entire life being the best and suddenly they see Tiger or suddenly they see Jordan or Messi and they're like oh my god everything that I know about who I am who I identify with as a human is now being compromised by the fact that I'm number two and he's clearly number right. one there was that one year that Ernie Els came in second place in all four majors and uh, you know he's from South Africa uh, Ernie so he's like well these I think Tiger may have won three, so you're like, well, if he wasn't around, I won three, and maybe I think he's won just a, a handful, but if those guys that came around in that in that era of Tiger winning 15, 
Uh, I know Lee Trevino. Lee Trevino was a Jack Nicholas killer. Like he's, you know, I could beat Nicholas. He goes, and I didn't hit it that far. And then I remember we played with a guy, and he bombed it, and he told that guy, if, if I hit it that far, Nicholas would be a pharmacist, you know, because his dad was a pharmacist. <laughs> and he goes, I never hit it that far, but I always found a way to beat him. Like I wasn't intimidated by him. And that that's uh, it's a, it's a rarity, I think, and, and especially I think maybe as kids all get trophies that when you play like they want maybe everybody to kind of be the same it's it's tough to be good when they're not keeping score right. or tough to be good i always thought that it was difficult because i i always came in second and never won a championship but it made me try harder now if everybody ended up the same would i have tried as hard even though i always came in second right i mean what what is what inspires you to be better if knowing when you sign up you're already going to get an award right Here's, here's one that um, a, a coach said to my son. My son was big, big in soccer, loved it. And uh, he just quit to be a skateboarder now. He just <laughs> skateboards, that's all he does, you know. He's California oh, yeah. now, you know. Oh, yeah. But he loved football, he loved soccer. But he, he was having trouble getting enough speed. So he, he had a coach working on, you know, getting faster, you know. And this this coach was a kind of not Olympic level, but really, really great sprinter, this uh, woman who was teaching him. And she said she was at a, a club and there was two of them, a girl who always won and then she was always second. And she was at this big state, you know, race and she's she's getting set up to go and she said her coach is at the side, you know, try to get her and the girl that always wins, you know, because they're, they're, they're against the best people in the state. Yeah. And he looks at her and, and says to her, like, you're going to be second. You know, that's great. You're going to be second. And she said, I looked at it and I just said, victory. He said to me, victory. Yeah. And she said, it just changed my headspace. Love that. And she beat that girl and beat her every time from then. Because before that, she always oh, had the headspace of, okay, I'm... I'm second in the state because I'm training with this girl who's amazing. Wow. But when she saw that, she just changed her headspace and totally. And she went over to him and said, "You said victory, right?" And he went, "No, I said second. And she fired him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you never heard from him again. <laughs> He's in disgrace now. So anyway, back to tenants lager. <laughs> oh, the best, right? You know, and it's killed many people, George. I drank it at Carnoustie. I drank it wherever I could get it. <laughs> and then I took, I, I told the guys at Carnoustie at the country club, I said, hey man, do you mind if you give me a couple of glasses, the tea glasses? And I said, they said, yes, of course. I said, I'm starting a talk show in 2009. So I did the talk show for two years and every day I did the talk show, my glass that I had on the set was my tenant's glass. Wow, wow. Yeah. And then I went last time to the Jigger and I went to Scotland, you couldn't, you, I couldn't find it in oh, those really? places. What? They because took it out. Because of the change, I think. Because they're getting expensive Italian laggers in I or something? It, yeah, it was gone. My dad worked his whole life in tenants. So I was in tenants oh. all the time oh, because, wow. you know, if it was bring your son to yeah. work or whatever. <laughs> yeah, whatever it was. I'm in tenants. Yeah. Bring your son to work so he could drive you home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and my dad. But it was awesome. Every Friday he would arrive, he wore a long coat. And he would arrive, I always remember, and he'd take his coat off and he had tenants cans all oh. round his belt. <laughs> so he had like ten cans of tenants, you what, know. That pilfered, pilfered. That he'd stolen out of tenants, you know. <laughs> pilfered well, isn't that stolen. Brilliant? But it was That's but it, 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 who owned it and what was the percentage of it wasn't lead based. I don't I don't <laughs> think I don't even think it's the alcohol. I think whatever chemicals. It was lovely. Isn't it and just I the best? Not having it. yes. It's a great beer. We I have really about did. three or four it. days of, of good weather in Scotland, as you know, <laughs> a year. And sitting outside with a pint of tenants is oh my it's, it's my favourite. I was in um South Korea doing a thing and I was walking past a bar. And they had the tea tenants. <laughs> I went and and I sat there, and they put they had uh, uh, music on um, records, record oh, nice. players, and somehow it was some Scottish bar, 
And I sat there with a tenants in, oh, in South Korea. A slice of home. Oh, my God. It really God. is amazing. But That's it's still awesome. in full production, right? It's still in full it's production. Amazing. It's got to be the biggest beer in Scotland still, right? I, I would think so. Can't think of anything I bigger. took a picture on the balcony, and, and it had a tea underneath the glass. Mm. And as I'm drinking it, we took a picture underneath. So it's me mm-hmm. here with the tea under, taking a drink, and... It's nice. brilliant. My favorite. Have Isn't you had? Great? Have you had? Years. Have you had Boddingtons? I'm going to represent Manchester. Here. <laughs> Boddingtons out of Manchester. So, so Boddingtons was. I think it was the first. If it wasn't the first beer, it was. It was closely followed after Guinness, that had what's called a widget at the oh, bottom yeah. of the can, just like this. When you crack the can here, it releases a gas but, that but, creates the yes. foam. And Boddington's is a very creamy lager. It's a br- uh, not a lager, uh, an ale. Darker, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's a. Br- what do they have? Is the bit. bottom is is it uh, is it not smooth or is it a gas? Well, wait, the, they said about the way the they widget. carve the the glass. So that- the it's actually because I've I've done it before. I've I've dismantled the can and looked inside it. It's basically a little plastic canister that when you release the top here, it pushes it, it, it opens it and it fires a whole bunch of air through the beer, creating a head. Brilliant technology Ooh. and a and a really really yummy beer, Boddingtons. They feature on the TV show Friends quite a bit because they go to London uh, and Joey yeah. and Chandler end up drinking Boddingtons and then they bring it back to New York together. Oh, I'll tell you what's a good beer. A good beer though. Uh, George uh, Lopez. Uh, the little Moki. Yeah. Little Moki. Oh, yeah, little Moki. Little Moki. Little Moki. Little Moki. Little Moki. We all like a little. Wow, you guys are like cheers, man. You guys know your beer so. George, let me ask you this because I'm fascinated by stand-up comedians and going back to the thing that we talked about with, in terms of like the best of the best type thing. I know shows nowadays are different for you because yeah. you, you do your own show and that's your thing. But back when you were younger and kind of on the circuit and doing the comedy store and the Laugh Factory and stuff like that, can you remember a specific time where a comedian went up and you thought, I'm in real trouble here because he's brilliant and I'm not sure if well, I'm Well, here's what I saw. Level. Here's what I saw. So I wanted to be a comedian from the time I saw Freddie Prince Cheek on the Man Senior. You know, right. Chico yeah. Man. and um, Richard Pryor, of course, Cheech and Chong. But I used to listen to Richard Pryor, the live in Long Beach, which he did like seventy nine, eighty, and then in eighty, uh, there was a Canary Yellow Rolls Royce idling in front of the Comedy Store on Sunset, by itself on the in front of it, kind of near the big room. And then there's the the room you can see from the street you can look into. So there is a canary yellow Rolls Royce. And as people get out, they go, Richard Pryor's in that car. And they're like, what? And you look over there, and behind the wheel is Richard Pryor. So my buddy Ernie goes, go over there and say hello. Like, nobody's really going over there. So I kind of walk, and I cruise, and I look in. I get a little bit closer. I'm not sure what I was going to do. But as I get closer, I hear him using a micro cassette recorder and listening to himself and you can hear the laugh and you hear <laughs> then he does it again then he does it back again and does it again and then I backed up and he goes what, what, what's up I said hey man I really saw everything I needed to see I saw a guy at the top of his game with a micro cassette recorder listening to his show back and forth in between shows and I and from that point I did that so I recorded all my shows. I oh, transcribed yeah. all my shows, mm. and I used that. I didn't need to say hello. I met him later, but it's like seeing somebody who's really good when you wouldn't expect to see somebody who's that good still working on their craft. right workshop. So still working, still yeah, working at that in between level, the shows. Just yeah, he went to brilliant. his car by himself with his cassette recorder. He's listening to himself in between shows, and you're like, that's what. Right, Somebody student of do. the craft. I saw Chris Rock at the Comedy Store years ago, and coincidentally, about a week later, I saw him at a Laker game and and went over and spoke to him. But at the at the Comedy Store, he got up. It was it was probably close to eleven o'clock at night. A lot of people had been on. He got up. He had a little notebook, and he said, "Hey guys, I'm just trying to work some stuff out here, so bear with me." And you know, he's kind of looking down at his notes a little bit more, making notes as he's you know telling a joke and stuff like that. That particular show must have been his Oscar show ah, presentation uh, yes. that he did because a couple of weeks later he did the same jokes at the Oscars. And I saw him at the Lakers. He didn't give a fuck about who I was. He, I, was I, I, had, I was lucky enough to have courtside seats. He had courtside seats as well. He was walking past me. 
And as he walked past me, I said, hey, man, I saw your show at the Comedy Store. It was fantastic. And I, I said, I, I really loved watching the process. And he was like, we, we all do that. You know, every comedian does that. You just sometimes you see a polished performance. Sometimes you don't. But he was really impressive in the same way where I thought he's letting it all hang out. You know, he's willing to show you how it all works. Well, George you know? Wallace is a comedian who he does Vegas a lot. He's probably doing it 50 years. So he would walk up with a notepad and he would go, the whole world is sick. And he goes, a lady went to the store. She went in to try to buy a hat and they wouldn't let her buy a hat because she, and then nobody would laugh and he'd take his thing and he'd go, all right. <laughs> he'd go, fuck that one. And he'd try another one and he has, and when it laughed, he would go, okay, that's a good one. Nice. And when nobody laughed, he'd walk over there and go, all right. That's a no. But even as a tool, if that was a tool, it was, it was a brilliant tool. That's because great. The, the plus you keep, and when nobody laughed, it was funnier because he'd go, all right, take that one out. You know. Have you seen comedians in cars getting coffee? Yes. Jerry Seinfeld. And so I think it's, it's, a brilliant, it's a brilliant idea. You should be on that show, be, George. But, yeah. when, when, you, when, when I'm watching all of these comedians on this show, I'm thinking, well, okay, well, there's a gap here. There's George Lopez here. Yeah. Where's George Lopez? There's a bit so, of a gap there, yeah. What do you think about Jerry Seinfeld? Um, I think Seinfeld is... It's fantastic. I think he's great. Observational, humor-wise, um, incredible. But mm. also, I would say, if you look at Seinfeld, you have to look at Larry David, right. who was not a performer, but a creator of that show. Right. Mm. So Larry David was George Costanza, kind of. Right. Right. And Larry David knew a guy that was like, I think the guy's name was Kenny Kramer. Right, right. So a lot of it was Larry David. So it was great to see Seinfeld have his success, but also Larry David to come into the, in which he hated. Larry David hates being in public. He hates performing. He hates all of it. Like when you see him, that's who he really is. Right. I yeah. saw him out there at Riviera one time and you see a guy that's pretty much wearing a fucking beekeeper's outfit. He's got, <laughs> he's covered in canvas. He's got canvas gloves and a thing with a net with like the two holes in the mouth and you're like, it's kind of a sex doll, but it's kind of a beekeeper. And you go, that's Larry David. And you're like, get the fuck out of here. And you go up there and through the mask, you can see he's like, hey, George, how was up, Larry? And he hates the sun, you know but he me? loves golf. <laughs> and and the funny one of the funniest things he said is, because there's a thing in golf where they say, when you take a swing, pretend like you're throwing the club at the ball. Right. But Larry would throw the club at the ball and then go get it and then have to come back and hit it again because he said to me, you know you know that thing, George, where they said you throw the club at the ball? I go, yeah. He goes, but I'm really doing it. He goes, so I take the club and I hit the ball and I let the club go and the ball's going straighter. I go, but then I got to go get the club and then get another club and then do it again. But his... You know, nobody's ever done. You don't see anybody on the tour fucking throwing their club at the ball <laughs> right, right, and then right, having right. to go get it. Right. But he was literal. Like, he's like, you know, I'm literal. Nobody, and there's nobody really like him. Like, that fellow yeah. is great. And there's yeah. a lot of guys. Chris is great. Chappelle's oh, yeah. amazing. But there's nobody that has the amount of, this mother like tiramisu of comedy. Yeah. There's so many <laughs> ingredients yeah. that have to go in there for it to be good. He's and the, that's him. He's the only guy that I saw at a party that I felt I had to go over and say hello. You're very good at that. You can say what? hello and say hello, hello to, to people. people. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what I mean? And, 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 but telling people hard, that you it, like what they it's do. It's a hard thing to do. It's I, hard wait, to do. I can't do it. Why? What's the thing? It's I a cold know. open. It's a cold read. You're right. like, uh, But who doesn't want to get told, hey, I like your stuff. You're fantastic. Yeah, you, oh, but I find you that. You're full of yourself. See the word? No, no. <laughs> but, wife, when I was married, my wife, she loved uh, sisters. <laughs> see the word was the sisters. So, you know, my wife goes up to see the word and tells her how much she thinks, she, how great she is. And she's like, oh, wonderful. I just kept <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, that's no. a drag. Maybe I that's the you. thing. Maybe I'm always dreading that. That's but I did go up to It's Lyon a cold David. open. I remember you open. met him. I remember I was, I yeah, was, and I was so a, into the fact that you met him. And I, and I don't even know why I went over. I just had to tell him because I feel <laughs> yeah. the same way. Yeah. I feel there's... There's something so brave and brilliant about his comedy, and it just works yes. so well. And you can watch it over and over; it's brilliant. And I just had to kind of tell him that in some way. And uh, but you it, told yeah. me that he was he was astounded that you knew 
what he did, right? He was like, what? You, you, you watched that show? And you yeah. were like, yeah, I love that show. He's like, oh, okay. I mean, I'm, I, I just, I, I totally agree. I think it is uh, really something. Special. You know how great Larry David is? I had him on my talk show. We were doing DNA testing. And he had to come. So we were doing DNA testing. And then he had to come back and get the results. And when he came back, he found out he was like, you know, 35% Native American. And then he goes, you know, George, now it all makes sense. And I go, well, what do you mean? He goes, because when I was a kid and I played Cowboys and Indians, I rooted for the Indians. I didn't want to be a cowboy. I always wanted to be an Indian. I never wanted to be a cowboy. I mean, just amazing. Yeah, he's Talking brilliant. about yeah, comedy, and, and, and I know you're meant to be interviewing us and all that, but no, no. I'm just, I'm really interested that how... How does uh, being a stand-up, and you've probably told this story hundreds of times and you don't want to, but being, doing stand-up and then getting your own um, sitcom, how does that, does someone just see you? Do you become like, um, you know, man. how does that, and then, you know, because you, how long did your sitcom run? That was a long time. My wasn't sitcom it? ran 120 episodes, still on. I mean, you know. Oh, yeah. And you know, um, man, Sandra Bullock is the per really the person that saw me that said, um, you know, I think that there's something here. A guy, Jonathan Comack, who today, this tells you how, he's the first guy, he's in Iceland. So this guy is the first guy that ever saw me before Sandra saw me. And this is today. So he and I stayed close, and that's tw 20 years, 21 years. So he was working for Sandra, just as a friend going out looking at talent. And then he had seen me, and then a whole year later came back and said, you know, I have somebody that I want to see you, and it was her. So when she saw me, <clears throat> but you also have somebody that sees you and stands behind you. Right. Mm. That doesn't say, you know, if she brought her CAA agents to see me and they didn't get it, yeah. that she's not like, yeah, I tried. She yeah. stayed committed to me, and that, was very rare to find somebody like that. Right. But I, I never imagined a sitcom. I remember seeing Drew Carey get his sitcom, and it was like number one. I remember seeing Tim right. Allen before, mm -hmm. who was hilarious in, in the clubs. Yeah. And I was always a bit of a work in progress. So, But when I got to the point where you started to tell the stories of your life for the show, it worked perfect mm. at that time. And, and I'd been doing it for 21 years then. Mm. Wow. But Having a guy like Bruce Helford who did who worked on Roseanne, who oh. created Drew Carey, and who worked with me, is you had a guy who was knew how to take those stories and make them into a show, which is the mm. which is I think the hardest part. Right. Like you know, Andrew Dice Clay had a had a show called Bless This House on CBS before King of Queens, and Dice was hot, and he had Bruce. And Dice was like, I don't know if it's gonna be like this. Maybe we shouldn't even have a neighbor, you know. So, so he, he fucking called Les Moonves at home on a Saturday. Charlie uh, Sheen's friend. Uh, uh, Moonves, right? The head of CBS to right, complain right. about the show. And Monday, fucking Moonves canceled the show. Oh wow! Because he had a star call him at home. Yeah. Which nobody really does. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a bold move. And Moonves yeah. was like, "One bad move. Don't do it. Don't ever call me. Don't I will it. never call no, me. He he has, you me. have my office I number. I don't even have your number. <laughs> you got my agent's number, yeah. but never at home. <laughs> you wow. know, and he's calling to complain about his showrunner. Wow. And on Monday, bye -bye. Fucking, that's, a that's, that's a heavy flex. That's a heavy flex. I was at, I was at uh, uh, doing my show when a couple of people who came to my table read said, oh, we have another table read at 10.30 for a pilot. I forgot who was in it, but when they came back 90 minutes later, the president of Warner Brothers TV, Peter Roth, canceled the show after the table read. Ooh. So it's war. It's like you might last oh, a yeah. day. Right. You might yeah. you might make it to the end of the war, come back to New York and ticker tape, or you somewhere in between, Right. it might be the end. Christopher Titus, who had a show on Fox, mm -hmm. 88 is the number to syndicate. After the last season, they had 84. Oof. I mean, alleged, I'm not, you know, whatever whatever he is, they didn't bring it back just so they could say, fuck you, you'll never get to syndication. Right. And he did 84. 84 oh, doesn't do anybody good. It's a good. petty you get, business. <laughs> you have to get past 88. I mean, so much of this business 
there's so much that that phrase that we hear about catching lightning in a bottle you know mm -hmm. it's so difficult to make a movie or make a tv show or make a podcast any kind of project i've had friends over the years you know kind of sit me down over a beer whatever and be like but not involved in the industry dom why don't you make a f film that yeah. you're the star of and just yeah. write your main role and then give it to a guy and turn it into a film. Like, do you have any idea how yeah. difficult that is? Like, you know, obviously, Bills and I met when we when we made Lord of the Rings. The fact that we could walk on set of Lord of the Rings day one, the amount of moving cogs and pieces oh. just to get us to that place, let alone delivering day mm -hmm. one through to day, you know, 350 or however many days we got to, mm -hmm. is crazy. So. What was amazing about Lord of the Rings, I mean, there's so many incredible things about Lord of the Rings, but w one of the great things that it seems the entire cast seemed to grab hold of is how lucky we are mm. and that we would ra there's no other place that we would rather be, which I think came from Pete, because when we would ask Pete about him being tired and exhausted and working night shoots and day shoots at the same time and all of this pressure, he would say to us, there's nowhere else I'd rather be. I want to be a director making Lord of the Rings. I'm on set doing it. Let's go to work. And, and, and you yeah. know, in, in reading you guys and the I can have another beer. Information, go yeah, for, please. please. Get on, yeah. We got um, more. We got more. I tell you, what's a good beer? George Lopez. <laughs> Lil Moxie. Never mentioned. Oh, <laughs> available wherever you get Lexi. your George Lopez products. Sponsored. <laughs> it's fantastic beer. How did you hear about? How did you hear about it first? Like, how did you, your agent call you? Somebody say, "Hey, we have this thing for you to go in on." I'll yeah. tell you, George, my best girlfriend of all time, Nick, lived about eight minutes away from my house. And we used to hang out at her house because it was above two bars that we liked. So we would hang out at her house, have a few beers, and then when the bars opened, we'd go downstairs and keep drinking. And I was at her house one day. We we're, were listening to Stevie Wonder and the Jackson 5 on, rate, on uh, record, and someone passed me a supplement a, a, a pullout from the Guardian newspaper, uh, uh, sorry, the Times newspaper. Amazing. And the front cover of the Times newspaper was this iconic shot of Gandalf and Frodo in the Lord of the Rings. And it said on the cover of the newspaper, Pete Jackson, New Zealand director, set to make Lord of the Rings trilogy. And I opened it up and I read that it was in pre-production. And at that point, this is how far back it goes. And at that point, Sean Connery, was the hottest tipped actor to play Gandalf. Oh, wow. And Gandalf was the thing that they were building it all around. And I sat and I read it. I remember listening to Stevie Wonder. We were listening to um, Boogie On Reggae Woman yeah. by Stevie Wonder. Yeah. An absolute fucking Fantastic. jam. Mm -hmm. And I said, I was an actor at the time. I'd been acting for probably three or four years. And I said to Nick, this looks amazing. And that was it. And then from then on, I had auditions and spoke to my agent. But that was the first time I ever knew that it was going to turn into a uh, into a film. Are you familiar with the source material? Like, where are you at with the, the books? My dad is a huge yeah. fan. So we lived in Germany as kids. And as we would drive from Germany to England every Christmas to see our grandparents, it was about a, like a six-hour drive. You're going three hours across Germany on a ferry, three hours up England. Um, we would listen to the BBC Ian Holm recordings of Lord of the Rings where, wow. where Ian Holm played Frodo, which is a, an incredible performance. I went to Greece a few years ago on my own to one of the smallest uh, Greek islands. It's called Telos. There's like 700 people live there. And I went on my own and I downloaded this recording, which is like a 13-hour recording yeah. to my iPod. Laid by the ocean, laid by the pool, listened to Ian Holm after I'd worked with him, which is an incredible experience. So I, I knew a little bit about, we'd read The Hobbit. I, hadn't, I didn't read Lord of the Rings until I was kind of 15, 16. My dad kept saying to me, you're not ready. It's, it's you know, it's a thousand pages. It's too big, it's too big. Yeah, it's a commitment. Because I love The Hobbit. I was like, well, if it's like The Hobbit, I'll love it. He's like, it's not really like The yeah, Hobbit. Yeah. It's, it's pithy, it's weighty. And then I read it when I was 15, 16, spoke to my dad about it, and then had auditions. You were the first guy cast, right? Yeah, apparently, yeah. Wow. Uh, we, uh, Before Ian McKellen. Yeah. I was, um, it's funny you're talking about uh, Sean but Connery. Was it Sean Connery? No, Sean Connery was, he, he did get offered the part of Gandalf. Um, and I met him at a dinner later, Absolute, years and years Absolutely later. not. <laughs> <laughs> no and question. That, I, 
<laughs> I love Sean Connery. You know, you can't be Scottish sure. and not love Sean Connery. He's an amazing actor, great, uh, incredible. And I'm sitting with him at dinner, and um, I'm, I'm with like a politician. The politician's like, "Oh, Sean, tell the story of how you were offered Lord of the Rings." And, and you could tell Sean didn't want to talk about it. And I was like, "Oh God, this is so embarrassing." You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but apparently, he just. He, he he didn't know Lord of the Rings mm. and he just didn't understand the script. Right. He was like, I don't get this, wizards <laughs> and elves. And you know. And apparently if he had done it, it would have been the biggest contract of any actor ever because they were offering him 10 points or something yeah, on goals. Yeah. Oh, he would yeah. have just been, you know. But um, yeah, when I heard about it, every actor in Britain that I knew was, was uh, auditioning for it. Same. Everybody's going to London and I just, you know, I went down and wow. they gave me script pages for Pippin. I read it, and I remember I wasn't really ready. The way these things always work out, yeah, you, sure. the ones that you don't really think you've done well at, I yeah. thought, oh, well. And I was doing a few auditions. I went to London for the All weekend. right, show off. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I got a phone call saying, uh, Pete Jackson wants to meet you. Went back down to London, met him once. We did some scenes and uh, got cast. I've done other things that are like small theatre things, musicals, where they want to see you nine times. <laughs> yeah. You're like, yeah. I remember going for a musical and I was on the ninth audition. Dude. And I said to the, there was a line of producers and I said, this is it, by the way. It's not <laughs> going to get any better than this. This is what you're getting. Right. Yeah. It's either take it or leave it, you know? Uh, nine times is my max. I Never. mean, nine That's times. That's Whereas ridiculous. Pete Jackson... He you is. know, he's. I think that's what makes him a great director. He makes decisions really fast. You yeah, know? yeah. Very. Even on set, I remember him sitting, you know, directing, and there'd be a line of people with swords and yeah. cups, and this is for, you know, this is Aragon's sword. Uh, not that one, that one. This is the cup for the, yeah, that one. Yeah. Just like decisions, right. yeah. you know? Yeah. So he's, much of directing is just making decisions yeah. constantly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But I think, you know, we were thinking about this in the car, but the term director could apply to, like, you know, Alfred Hitchcock. It could apply to Orson Welles, but not... I think Pete, what he did was beyond, like, the mm, scope right. of the... You know... Yeah, filmmaker. Uh, yeah, a filmmaker. Mm. He's a visionary because you, yeah. you, you have to see things with your eye first and then you have to trust that your eye is the eye of the audience and the mm -hmm. eye of the book and the eye yeah. of the, 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 he has to keep track of things that are not in sequence. I mean, yeah. like, it's just, he it's also amazing. has to, he also has to maintain that stance, which I don't necessarily think Pete is comfortable with in his civilian life of saying, my word is final. I'm the boss mm -hmm. and I'm going to run with it. Pete in his like uh, non-director yeah. life is just very, Easy going. He he loves the Beatles. He loves good food. He loves hanging out. He likes to have fun. He loves practical jokes. He's a lovely guy. He's very easy going. But at work, it's his word, and he and he has to say, "I'm the man around here." And I I think that is a really tough position to be in as did, a director, especially he, when you're sensitive like Peter. Did he keep mm. a lot of the same? Keep up a lot of the same people as much as a he lot could, of his crew, right? the people around him. Yeah. His, yeah. So his first assistant director when we were making Lord of the Rings is now one of his producers. So he basically, you know, if they're great, he keeps them mm -hmm. and promotes yeah. them. Unfortunately, the, the cinematographer, the DOP on Lord of the Rings passed away, which I think was a massive turning point sure. for Pete mm -hmm. because they, they'd made an extraordinary amount of fantastic work together and he died. And that was almost kind of his right-hand man. Mm -hmm. But in terms of producers and heads of department, he tends to keep the same people, right? Yeah, and just that that sort of New Zealand vibe. You know, have you spent any time down there, George? No. New Zealand, it's an amazing country. Just, there must yeah. be some good golf courses down there, Absolutely. right? There I must think so, be, yeah. Right? There must be. I don't know. But he, um, that sort of, it's sort of family sort of vibe that they have there where even through the time that we were there off and on for three, four years, people will have started as drivers and then they went on to camera and then they might go from camera to sound he, if you like someone it's not specifically i want you for that like if you feel like you want to move around he's totally up for that as well yeah. and i think the last time i was there they said that 
he's the biggest employer in Wellington, the city, because <laughs> the, all the post stuff that he does now, special effects and all that, he's got so many people, you know, it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, he's an amazing guy. Yeah. yeah, he's amazing. Well, it's such an all-encompassing job to just life on set. It's like if you find someone and you like that person, mm. probably as long as they can do the job, keep working with keep them, them in any there, capacity, right? whether it yeah. is, you know, if they started driving, then did sound, whatever. It's like, yeah. I want to spend, you know, 15-hour days. That's a small amount of people, so if I can find someone. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, Lord of the Rings, in a lot of ways, because an incredible experience for all of us, I'm sure, it's kind of compromised further jobs for me because I always base it on, well, it's not, it's not the friendships I made on Lord of the Rings. It's not yeah. the chemistry of Lord of the Rings. It's not the vibe. It's not the, the feeling. And you can never capture that again. But we, we were all isolated on, on this little island. We all cared so wow. specifically about the project and the director and, and the source material. And none of us got distracted at a time where mobile phones, cell phones were not really a big deal. Yeah. You know, the internet had just started. When I left England to get to New Zealand, there was a, a survey that I used to fill out in my favorite music magazine at the end of each year. And if you send it in, you win a, you win a competition if they pull you out of a, a <laughs> raffle. And it was like, you know, band of the year, song of the year, uh -huh. album of the year, album <laughs> cover of the year. And the final question, was website of the year, and I had no idea what it was. <laughs> I got to New Zealand, Billy Space and I hung out, hanging out with you know, everyone, and, and Elijah and Orlando and Vigo and all these people, and within about three months, not only were Billy and I aware of the internet, but we were consistently building into our off days a chance to go to an internet cafe. So that slightly opened up the world, but we were still kind of locked into this island mentality. Yeah, we? yeah. I, I'm not sure. Like the guys who make making the new Lord of the Rings Amazon film, yeah. you know, uh, Amazon TV show in New Zealand. Of course, I, I, I'm sure it'd be fantastic, and, and I, I, I really hope it is, and, I, and I'll watch it. I'm not sure if they're going to be able to be in that same isolated bubble that we were because the world has now changed. It's changed. You know? Where were you when you found out you got it? I was I was doing a workshop for a new play <laughs> in Edinburgh, <laughs> and I remember I, it was it was the 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 theatre was down. It was a basement theatre, and I came up and uh, oh, they gave me a message. Man. You have to phone. You have to phone your agent. And I didn't have I didn't have a cell phone, so I went to a phone box, phone my agent. And my agent, who sadly has passed away now, she was a wonderful woman, and she says, oh, guess, guess who's playing Pippin in Lord of the Rings? <laughs> and I was it's like, not you! <laughs> it's not you! And you didn't get a really it. mean phone call. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's it's John Hanna. He'll be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and it was just a phone call, and I was <sighs> like, and she said, um, uh, Pete Jackson wants to speak to you. Uh, tomorrow or something and I was like okay uh, whatever time it was and I remember when he called I was on the bus going from Glasgow to <sighs> Edinburgh to continue on this play mm -hmm. and I was trying to be quiet as, as Pete Jackson was saying you know you know you're going to be here for a year and I was like yeah yeah I was like I'm, I'm, I'm on a bus I'm on a bus Pete. <laughs> wow. but you really were you away that long huh yeah, yeah it was yeah. Like a year and a half straight through oh. and was and that then, for all three did no, you not? well, oh, kind of. Kind well, of. It was supposed to be all three. Mm -hmm. And Pete did this brilliant gamble where it was supposed to be a year and a half. So, wait, just to interject, it's October 99 all the way through to December 2000, which is. That's only like three months. Oh, well, that can't be right. Do, wait, no. <laughs> isn't it? No, that's, that's 14 months. No, that's 99. 14 months. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> that's you got what it was. some change. <laughs> so, uh, that, that, that was supposed to be all three movies. And. Mm. Um, Pete there was did. no way that could... Nah, no. because those movies... <laughs> Come on, no. So yeah. he concentrated on the first one, and he didn't Brilliant. really have the second. Thought. He did some, you mm -hmm. know, we did it all, but knowing that if, if we have a success in the first one, 
then the studio will throw money at two and three. So when the first one was a success, they got us back to New Zealand for like three months or something. If, I mean, it might be more. Maybe more to finish the second one. And then the next year, we're back down again for four months to finish the third one, you know. I remember crying at the rap party. We you had a oh, crazy yeah. rap party for principal photography, crying, hugging Pete and hugging his oh. wife. I mean, oh, God, I'm going to miss you guys. He said, you'll be back here in a couple of months. <laughs> what? <laughs> he said, yeah, yeah, you'll be back. You'll, you'll it's come all over back. the internet, haven't oh. you? We, we, it's going to keep, it's ongoing. I was like, oh, okay, sounds great. It's yeah. so beautiful, man. Congratulations to both. I mean, yeah. it's just it's just one of those things that, you know, somebody has to come in second. You know, when somebody auditions and you, you oh. pick yeah. the one. Today I was at a golf course and I saw the guy that played my best friend on my first show. He gave me a big hug. And we'd been through so much. It's almost 20 years. But I remember the couple other people that came in, the three choices, and he won. And, you know, you think about the other two guys. like right. This guy... It changed his life. It changes yeah. your family's life. It changes yeah. the life of yeah. your children and stuff. Generations. And it really is, it's a big win. I th and they do make a lot of movies, but they don't make a lot of Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I mean, I, I think my role was offered to someone else before me, and they turned it down. An actor called Brecken Meyer. Do you know this guy? Oh, Brecken Meyer? Yeah, Brecken yeah, yeah, Meyer. Yeah. He did a couple of... I'll tell you what he's been. He was, like. in, uh, he was in Clueless. Right, right. Oh, right, right. So as far as I'm oh. aware, he was offered it, and he said, I don't want to go to New Zealand for two years. It's not in my game plan. So they then went to me, and I said, I'll take it. Yeah, thanks, You Brett. weren't actually Ooh. second. It was about 10 or 11, uh, actually, yeah. when they got to you. <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> wow. Yeah, man. Wow. I mean, like, those things happen. It's sliding doors in actors' lives. Mm. I remember my agent sending me the script for Amazing. The Hangover. And oh, right. he said, look, this is going to be a big hit. This is going to be a studio movie. This is going to be a big hit. And I, and I got him on the phone because they'd offered me a part. And I said, look, this is a great script. It's very funny. But I said, it's, it's a piece of Americana. You know, it's, it's, it's Marlboro Lights. It's Lucky Stripes. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's Coca-Cola. It's, it's hot dogs. It's something that I'm not born with. It's something that I'm not brought up with. I think an American person would play this better. And he said, well, look, it's, it's going to be a big hit. There's, there's a lot of heat behind it. And I said, yeah, I'm aware it's going to be a big hit. It's not for me. Obviously, The Hangover became a massive wow, smash. Sure. So you have those moments as an actor, and I think you just have to stay philosophical. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to make the right decisions. Ultimately, as long as you're happy with your choices, you have that to get That kind on. of reminded me of the conversation I had with Sean Connery when he gave up Gandalf. Yeah, yeah. Imagine all the money you'd have got, Tom. <laughs> Well, I think, yeah. like you said, he was. I think he was offered something like ten points on the gross, wow. he which would have, Scotland which would have been hundreds of millions, if not billions. Did they offer you that on the Hangover? No, they didn't. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> Give me Did the they, Connery dealer. I'm out. You get to hang out in Vegas though. Yeah, uh, but and he turned it down. Yeah, 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 Sean did. Well, yeah. Russell Crowe turned down Aragon as well. I heard. Oh, I didn't hear that. I heard that. that oh, really? We obviously had a an Aragon that came out to hang out with us, Stuart Townsend, like rehearsed and filmed and learned how to, oh. you know, work with a sword and sword fight and do dialect training with us. And about, well, it was actually at the end of our first day of principal photography, it was the four hobbits rolling down a hill, realizing that we're on a road. Frodo has been told you're not supposed to be on a road mm -hmm. by Gandalf. And we disappear under a wooded log and the, and the black rider comes on that day. We were all ushered into a room at the end of rap because we were told that the producers and the director wanted to speak to us, oh. and they told us that Stu Stuart, who had been who had at that point been been ready to play Gandalf uh, Gandalf <laughs> Aragorn for what two months maybe yeah, yeah. a little oh, bit more months, yeah. had been let go. So you just you know, and he's a great actor, and yeah. and he's you know he continues to work to this day. You just don't know what's going to happen, you know. Well, who took uh, Michael J. F in uh, Back Eric, to the Future? Eric Stoltz. Eric Stoltz, Stoltz, yeah. Eric Stoltz yeah. started, and then there's some they... footage out there on YouTube you can find seeing Ooh. them doing the same scenes. It's yeah. very surreal. So, yeah. so Tim Allen, you know, when he got Home Improvement, <clears throat> he ended up using Richard Carn, the guy with the beard, but he was the second choice. The first choice was the guy Stephen Tablowski. Who was in Groundhog Day, the, the guy that played the insurance guy oh, yeah, oh, with yeah, the glasses, yeah, yeah. who was doing quite a bit of movies at that time. So in that time that they was offered to him, he said, well, you know, I'm doing a lot of movies right now, and I'm not sure if, you know, I want to kind of do TV, and he turned it down, and they went over 200 episodes. So 
I don't care how many movies you're doing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Home Improvement, which yeah. was number one. I remember Tim Allen was at ABC, and they would say the number one comedy, but the number one comedy might be number 12 amongst yeah. the dramas. Yeah, yeah. And he went up there and said, I was number one when number one was number one. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't number one comedy. Right. And that guy turned that down, which is just, wow. I find it interesting. I, I find all of that He's stuff. had a fascinating life, Tim Allen, right? I mean, yeah. was he was he not he, like he was in, in prison. prison for a little mm -hmm. bit for uh, smuggling a bunch of marijuana? If you're, and, and I think coke, if you're, if you're in prison, listen, if you're in prison, record, you know. <laughs> I don't care, well, I, don't, I wouldn't say I don't care what prison, incarceration is incarceration, <laughs> but I'm not, I don't think you're sitting by there going, I'm going to be a star one yeah. day and have my own show. No, I think, but I think Tim is, you know, he's been, Hasn't used, hasn't drank. I mean, during the show, I think he drank. Robin Williams, too, as well, would tell me that when he was doing Mark and Mindy, that he would, like, they drink so much. I'm not sure where the devil comes from, you know? Right, that, right. That, that they would say to him, they'd go like this, they'd go, he goes, this is how he'd talk to me, George. And he'd lay, I'd lay, he goes, lay down on the ground. Then he'd go like this, Robin, so we're after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, they'd lean over him and talk to him. Wow, and then and he told me that it's like you know he was you know he would always ask me how you doing with this with the drinking and I would say uh, you know uh, I think I'm okay, but not like not like those guys did where they right. He was a fan of rings, really so there was going, a few yeah. occasions where I met Robin Williams. Um, did, wait, did we do charades? Yeah, with him? and New York. So we're in New York with the Saturday Night Live crew. And it was myself, Billy, Elijah, and Sean, and we did charades with Ed Norton, yeah. Robin Williams, <laughs> Amy, <laughs> Amy yeah. Poehler, Dude. amazing, um, Maya good. Rudolph, who was yeah. absolutely oh, so fucking good. hilarious. So good. She was hilarious, and Robin Williams was just like I'd never seen anything like it. It was just like he he'd been plugged into the electricity, you know. He's got to be on the Mount Rushmore of charades teammates. Oh, my oh, Who's good. better? You, you think you're better. good at improvising <laughs> until you're in there with those guys. Yeah. And he, 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 he basically did a Scottish accent from the moment he, he heard me talk. <laughs> that, I mean, you've obviously heard him yeah, do yeah. the golf thing. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, sure. That is a He's great brilliant. sketch, isn't Fuck it? No. But when, when, I was a young, when I was a young comedian there in 1979, he did the Comedy Store on Sunset. And there is one door that goes from the smaller room, the original room, to the main room. And you hear this thunderous fucking ovation. And the bathroom is by there. So you could really just take three steps and open the door. And when you open the door, he's in his khakis <laughs> with his... He came straight from Mark and Mindy. So he's in his jersey <sighs> shirt mm -hmm. with, the, with the suspenders and the khakis. And he's... Whoo, you know, he's doing this. He's, you know, when you see him do that, you're like, what the fuck, man? It's like Mork, but it's Robin Williams, and he's come from Paramount Studios Brilliant, to, straight the, there. to the comedy store. Did you see Jim Carrey when he was coming up? I, I did see Jim Carrey. Because he's a phenomenal talent, and, and as a young stand-up comedian, the stuff that he was doing was incredible. In 1991, when Comic Relief was on, just almost literally after the Rodney King beatings, or the beating of Rodney King, that, that thing, mm -hmm. And Jim Carrey did comic relief and went up there and did an impression of Stacy Kuhn, the lead detect the lead police officer who had a lisp. And he went up there and put him in his stand up with the lisp. And you're like, how do you That's crazy. And and not ask, hey, does anybody know who Stacy Kuhn is? He's one of the officers <laughs> accused. And he had the lisp. And if you heard him talk, you'd be like, this is this is him. But He's the brilliant. fucking balls that it takes to oh, go and yeah. do that. He's brilliant. He's brrilliant. Yeah. He's brilliant. He's such an incredible shining light. Billy and I have talked about Jim Carrey over the years. Like, obviously, his performances that they've captured on camera, Ace Ventura, Dumb and Dumber, you can go on. Incredible. But some of the more raw moments where he's in a stand-up comedy club yes. and you're capturing him at that point, like his Henry Fonda impression, incredible, or he, Clint his Eastwood. Whole face. And so Charles his whole face. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, He transforms. He's amazing. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, you get a little bit like, I know that he bought a few houses around him and it's a Zen garden and he's a little bit, you know, you, you lose a little bit, I think, of your... That spontaneity, because yeah. as life hits you and things happen, you, you, yeah. you're less of that. Right. But, you know, what gave Jonathan Winters the will to live was Robin-like. 
them doing things together. Right, right. When they were on Mork and Mindy and they would do the Johnny Carson together, like he, you know, Robin had a place to go where he found like a mentor, but I don't think Jim ever found a mentor in somebody in that, in the in the comedy world. Right, right. right. And it's tough to be that guy right. yeah. all the time. Yeah. Because eventually, I remember George Clooney told, that uh, Paul Newman told George Clooney, because we were all in the corner there, Warner Brothers, don't let them keep you inside. Like he said, don't ever let you know your fame or fans keep you inside. Right. And I think I think Jim was a victim to that. Of, yeah. Of being yeah, maybe a little bit being then, isolated. Yeah, and you never want to stay in. Right. George Clooney seems to have it all figured out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He's always the fact that he said he wouldn't out. get married again and he found somebody who's incredible and has yeah. children and stuff is really and they live nice in turn. Italy, yeah. and he's not interested in any of this bullshit. No. Yeah. He just lives in Italy, brings up his kids, does a movie or directs a movie when he feels like it. He seems like he's got it all he's figured out. It's out. weird, though, because, like, you know, we've hung out with a lot of those kind of people. Yeah. But to be honest, George, when we work together and we went out for one night, right. I don't think I've seen anyone getting as much as you did. Mm. I like I wasn't I honestly well, wasn't we were expecting in New Mexico. it. <laughs> right. Those are your, those mean, are your I, people, yeah. That, that, I, I, well, I got in a fight in fucking Hooters by no, a but, Latino yeah. Trump supporter that I, w- I went home before that. But I've I've never seen fun. people were so wanting to get to you that I I'd, I'd never I've been out with like a lot of people that don't get that sort of maybe it was because it was a bar or something maybe. I don't know yeah. but you you like didn't get a second we had a we had a good time we had a good time out there it, it was good well. and, and you were good at like okay and you took like 45 minutes out the evening to say hello to everyone and then it sort of diluted it and it kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. you know and I thought that, that was really smart but I don't think of because normally you see people looking over, but they're not they're not right. coming over. Whereas everybody just came at you. It was incredible. Well, was that hard for you? Like you're talking about, you know, George Clooney saying, you know, don't keep it, or don't keep him inside or whatever. Did you ever deal with that? Because you obviously at some point had to go from, you know, young George to well, you George know, king of the world. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. You know, I grew up very disconnected, and I and I think I still am. You know, I like, you know, I I play golf, and you know, I. I don't, I'm not dating anybody. I think, you know, if they say don't let them keep you in, I think I've 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 stayed in. Like, um, I went and saw Pat Monahan from Train on Thursday. I went to the desert. He was going to be out there. He's a friend of mine. And on Thursday night, they were going to have dinner. I didn't go. I knew I wasn't going to go. And then Friday, I played golf. And then Saturday, I came back. And yesterday, I stayed in. All day. So so today, I went to that. But but I'm a victim of uh, don't let them keep you in. It's not that it's it's a pain in the ass I just kind of always kind of been in you know yeah, so yeah. it's a it's but do you enjoy your own time George? I, I do is that I do is? yeah I'm I the same I do yeah so it's, a, it's different if you I, I need I need to be on my own yeah. a lot you know yeah. I struggle to to be around people and be me I sometimes feel like if I'm actually going to be 100% who I'm supposed to be it's too much for people right. I'm a little intense I'm a little highly strong. Well, here's the so thing. I'd rather be on my own and not not exposed. But if you that. guys, wherever you went in the world, and it had to be interesting because this is a this is a, a, a movies and stories that eclipse just you know not the United States. Now you're this is you, you're in a global franchise, yeah. right? So wherever you guys mm. would go, people would look and go, "Oh, wait a minute!" Oh, shit. And it's everywhere, right? Yeah. That that takes a bit to get used to. Yeah, yeah, I think the worldwide thing was worldwide, that was yeah. weird. Like you would go anywhere. I can't uh-huh. even go on and vacation without being like, well, no one's going to see me here. Yeah, I remember going to Mexico uh, and and uh, just after like the first or second movie, and people like in the middle of what I thought was nowhere, really quiet, in a cafe, and someone <laughs> would come over, and you're like, really? <laughs> That's the weirdest, you know? Yeah. yeah. I was in Tokyo with Billy and Elijah one time and Liv Tyler's boyfriend at the time called me up in my room and said, what, what are you doing? And I said, well, we don't have anything until tonight. And he said, I'm going to go watch Brian Wilson uh, record. I was like, oh. well, Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys? He said, yeah, he's here in Japan. I was like, oh, okay, I'll come. 
So we walked around this. Do you not know this story? I didn't know about that. Yeah. Yeah. We walked around this area of Japan where he had been told, go to this address and they'll let you into the recording studio. And we couldn't find it. So we spent like two or three hours walking around. He was, he was embarrassed and frustrated. He's like, I'm sorry, Dom. I was like, oh, it's sort of fine. And we're going under these little subways and all into these little alleyways. We ended up not being able to find it. And he said, I, I, I think I've blown it. I was like, you know what? It's not a big deal. We'll go back to the hotel. So we went back to the hotel. That night, we went out with uh, Kelly Osborne and what was her brother called? Jack. Jack. Jack, 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 yeah. Jack Osborne for dinner. Went out, had dinner, had a few drinks, whatever. And then I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flag because the next day we were working. So I, I headed home. And I remember being in this car that had been ordered for me for the night, which was a, you know, an S-class Mercedes, like, you know, all the bells and whistles, driving silently through the Tokyo streets. <laughs> and I remember thinking, okay, so today you got up late, you tried to go see Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys record a song, and then you ended up going out for dinner with the Osbournes, and you flagged early so that you can get up early the, early the next day. Like life, it's life weird. is bizarre. It, you know? it, 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 it becomes a trip. I remember yeah. I was with Sharon and uh, Cheryl Underwood and 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 Ozzy at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and a woman comes up, you know. They're, you could see where they were attractive in the time, and you look back, and, and she's like, oh, Ozzy, you know, do you remember me? You know, I saw you, and, and Ozzy, you go, no, I'm like, Ozzy. <laughs> and, 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 she's, and, and Sharon's like, he doesn't remember you, love, you know? <laughs> and then uh, she goes, can I take a picture? She goes, and then Sharon's like, no, we're not taking any pictures. And then she's, you know, she leaves, she's like, you can just see her go, Ozzy, do you, do you even know who this is? Like, oh, yeah, the con. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, he's like, I don't think he remembers her. Uh, but, you know, you could hear him saying, like, I don't know, I ended it. Oh, yeah. and back, and, you know, you're like, but it hap- I mean, imagine, because he's Aussie, he's got the hair, right. yeah, and yeah. he always has the glasses, and then she's there. But it used to be, I think you guys have been victim of it, fallen victim of this, where if you were eating, it was off limits. Like, if you're, if you're playing oh, yeah. tag and you're holding on to the pole, I'm free. You know, this is a free zone. <laughs> they don't care if you're eating. They don't care if your kid is freaking out. Right. They don't care if you're discussing something with your wife face-to-face where it looks like, you know, oh, I, I better not bother them. Yeah, anyone else, they, they would not say a word. Right? They come in now at, at all times yeah. to, to, for pictures and... I think even sometimes, I guess you guys know they're taking a picture of you when you, you don't know they're taking a picture of you right, or right. videotaping you because everybody has one. But Yeah. yeah. I, I have friends whenever, I, if I go to cafes or bars or family who, you don't know, lean over to me at a certain point and they'll be like, there's someone uh, just to your left who I think recognizes you. And I'll be like, I've seen them like 20 minutes ago <laughs> and I'm managing the situation like I know when I need to go over and say hey do you want to have a picture let's get it out of the way and I know where the exits are and I know where the entrances are and I know where I need to get to if it gets really hectic I can jump into the kitchen yeah. I know all of those places so what's happened with me over the years is I've been able to become very adept at socially managing situations because if I'm with my friends, it's not something that I need to think about. But mm-hmm. any random stranger, if someone comes over to me, I'll be like, okay, so this guy's, he's about 175. Looks like he goes to the gym. If I get into an argument with him, I'm probably going to lose this fight. So I'm going to, you know, talk and we'll sign. <laughs> yeah. He's drunk. He's a little belligerent. I'm going to sign his thing and, you know, yeah. have a little drink with him. Someone else comes over who's, you know, seems like they're going to linger on. How do we manage that? The people around me are always trying to protect me. We can take care of it. And I always remind them, look, I've been in this situation thousands of times and I know how to manage it. My mum and dad, it's, it's kind of a unique situation for them. Like, oh, we'll go over and speak to them. No, 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 no. Let me speak to them. Yeah. I'll know what to do, you know. So you must be a, a, an expert at that. But it is, it, it is a bit, you know, you would do a, a project and that would be the end of the project. But now it's like you guys are extensions of, of this project. Right, yeah. And when people see you, wherever they see you, wherever you are, you're still part of the project. It's like playing for, I mean, I guess if you were playing for the Chicago Bulls and wherever you went, you were still a Chicago Bull. I, you know, Michael Jordan, Pippen, yeah, Rodman, like right. and those guys Coach. like that. It also gets bigger over the years, right? It does you get, know, it's getting that. bigger over like, the years. Lord of the Rings was a huge deal and it was a smash hit and all that kind of stuff. But I would argue that in 2003, when Return of the King came out, at the, at the <laughs> big apex of, of yeah. that movie moment, 
it's not as big a feeling as maybe like like 2006 it's starting to ebb and people are like oh yeah lord of the rings yeah i've seen it it was a big deal at the cinema i'm kind of over it but by the time you get back to like 2015 2020 now it's become part of the classic movie arena, yes. you know? yeah all these we would we would, we left a message for someone today who was was he 12 when he saw the film yeah yeah so he was 12 when he saw Fellowship of the Ring. So that for him is, it's his movie going experience. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm, that's, that's more my generation, right? right? right. I'm, I'm the young one in the room. But what is it to, you know, when you've seen people who have been like tremendous fans, like, cause it fills so much of their, I remember one time I was on Arsenio and then I was in Orchard Park right outside of Chicago. And a guy brought, bought me a uh, Foster's, the log, the can. <laughs> And he's sitting there and he and I were drinking it and I was on Arsenio like on the, this was in the early 90s. And he said to me, I was in my trailer by myself watching you on Wednesday and here we are on Saturday and we're having a beer together. So you know that mm. people have those lives, man, where it takes on so much of their lives. And like, I think you, you, know, you do, you have to remember that every person you meet is a human being mm -hmm. and you can't like, you you can't make it less because it's it maybe happened. Like if something right. was, if you're at a screening or something, just because it's a hundredth person you've met, it's the first time that they've, and sometimes it's good for somebody to remind you. I remember, I was staying at one of the, the Disney hotels with my son <laughs> when he was young, you know, seven or eight years old. And something had happened. I hadn't packed something that we needed. So I was in a case taking something out to put it into another bag. And a young lady came past and she went, oh, Dominic Monaghan. Think it because we, we get mixed up all the time. Well, of course, I saw the pictures. It's like these guys all the time. All the time they're the same up. size, yeah. they're the right? same shape to end. Like a face swap. Yeah, thing. yeah. And the Mary Pepin thing, yeah. everybody. And she, I was doing this thing, and she went, Oh, Dominic Monaghan. I said, No, no, I'm not Dominic Monaghan. And, I, and she went, Oh, really? And I went, Yeah, yeah. And she went, Okay. And she walked away. And my son was really young, and he said, why didn't you tell her that you're Billy Boyd? Because she obviously got you confused. Yeah. And I was like, God, you're so right. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. you're like oh. just because I'm in that moment right. doesn't mean that I can't just take a breath and go, no, you're thinking of the other one. And, you know, I, I felt bad about that for about a week, you yeah. know, that my son had been like, well, why didn't you just tell her that it's the other guy from Lord of the Rings? You, you know, know, when I was in, when I was leaving a HBO thing shoot, like you know, and you leave, and the you know the car, the window, the SUV's dark, and this guy kind of waves, and I tell the driver, "Hey, man, hang on a second, man. You know, pull over. I get out. I say, what's up, dude?' He's like, "Oh, man, what's up?" You know, he goes, "Hey, I take a picture with you," and you're like, "Yeah, I take a picture," and then he puts it on Instagram, and he says that he's in a place where. You know, he's lost his like grandmother who was his uh. whole life, and you know he's walking down the street and he's like, I don't know if you know this, and he sees me and he get out, and you you know you shake hands with this dude and it you know not that not that particular, but I mean, mm -hmm. when people like our loves are so different because we love so many things, but in a world like that, like where a guy. Is suffering, or someone lives in it, or someone has that. That it's really most of their, you know, comic cons and things. Right. It's yeah. It's like it's so much of their life. And we can't say for five minutes, yeah, and, and maybe tell a story. But we do. Other. But we do. We should. We do, yeah, but you we can't, have to. You don't know what it is to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. and I think that's that's what's better about social media in the realm of these movies where. They're global. They catch on. There's NFTs now, that'll yeah. that'll you know NFTs, and then there's way, way more ways to collect, but way more ways to stay connected right. as well. Mm -hmm. So so your love is like it's not like you're loving somebody that can't love you back. You just see all these things, and they make you love something even more. Yeah, which I think ultimately is what's what's beautiful about either being a comedian or being an actor or being part of something that is this global yeah this this that's that. held in such high regard my thing has always been wherever you are i'll meet you at that place so if someone comes at me with the right yes. intention and they're cool 
I will try my dandest to meet you at that place. Of course, I've been in situations like Billy where <clears throat> I'm in a rush or something's going on or I'm stressed course, out and maybe, I, maybe I've yeah. not been able to meet those people at that place. What I really like is if someone meets me below that place right. and they don't expect that I can meet them there. Right. So if someone comes over to me, I'm sure you've had this, George. I know Billy has this as well. Someone will come over and go, I don't know, even know who you are, but uh, that person over there said to take a picture with you. And I'll go, okay, well, let's not do that then. <laughs> because clearly you don't want to take a picture with me. And it's only your friend that has instructed you to come over. So why don't we give it a pass? And they go, no, 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 I want to. Oh, now you want to take a picture. Yeah. So I'm always going to call people out on their shit. If you don't have any of that shit, let's take a picture. Let's have fun. We'll tell a story. We'll go. But I'll meet you at that place. And I think a lot of times with actors, performers, comics, whatever, Someone thinks, well, I own them. I saw them on TV. I own them. They're mm. mine. No, you don't. I'm a human being as well. Yes. On my own journey, having my own experience, living my own life. So come at me correctly and we'll have an experience. Outside of that, it's, it's all a gamble, you know? Because I could be in a bad mood or they could be in a uh, bad mood. I, I played golf with a guy in San Francisco at the San Francisco com, uh, uh, Golf Club. Historic play in San Francisco. Guy was a talker. On the first hole... The third guy we were playing with, I said, okay, so your job today is to stay between <laughs> me and him. I said, because he's going to talk my ear off all day, but just stay in between us. Right. So what he's talking about, he played with Michael Jordan once, and he was saying how great he was, and then on the 18th hole, there's 25 people waiting for Michael Jordan, right. and they only played together once. And because he called ahead and said, My, I'm playing with Michael Jordan. Uh, and Michael Jordan was like, oh, man, really? So he was nice, and then he left. Right. And then I told the dude, do you know why you didn't play golf with Michael Jordan twice? <laughs> <laughs> and, he said, and he said, why is that? And I said, because because you called all those people, and, right. and yeah. they were waiting for him at the 18th. So he goes, no, no, he was cool. I said, do what? you know why you only played golf with Michael Jordan <laughs> once? Right, right. <laughs> Because if there would have been nobody there, he'd have come back. Right. That's his job to be cool. That's what he gets paid for, you know? There's consequences we, if he's not cool. Right, yeah. right. Absolutely. And he was cool. He just didn't need a gallery, but, you know, hmm. such as such. I thank you guys both, man, really. I hey, mean, man. It's yeah. good to hang out with you. Do you want to talk at all about the, the podcast, about the, the friendship? Oh, yeah, 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 little, yeah. Sure. That's why we're here, taste. George. Yeah, I forgot. It's well, not just God. about George Little Bass. That, that, that can't be about this. <laughs> <laughs> It, but it is a wonderful. Po I mean, you guys have such great camaraderie together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, great I, friends. I'm not, I think we it's not great this, friends. But. We've been hanging out for a while now, you know, and we just thought, you know, it, it seemed like a podcast seemed like the the natural thing because we can do this. So whatever we're doing during the week, we can say, oh wow, did you watch that TV show? We can talk about mm -hmm. it, as well as getting, you know. Friends from Lord of the Rings and all that. And yeah, absolutely. It just seems like that. It just seems like a fun thing. To I do, think for know? fans, it's a perfect. It's a perfect thing for people who are yeah. fans and people, oh, people who are fans of yours. Because like, very honest, isn't it? It's, it's very, very immediate honest. and honest. And then you got I the best you promo because it looked like you guys were in two different parts of the world. Yeah. And then you guys walked over. And you're like, oh. <laughs> we we, <laughs> we, we shot bro. that in Billy's house. <laughs> Billy, Billy's <laughs> son. <laughs> Billy's son shot that for us. <laughs> oh wow. Which is brilliant. It really was. It's really good. Oh good. Good. Because every time you see it, it looks like. Like, I think there's like ocean behind you. Right. It's, it's, it's it's images, images. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what's great, the, the, the feedback that we're getting right now, which is something that Billy and I really respond to, is of course people love Lord of the Rings and they know that they're going to get a little bit of Lord of the Rings each episode. But what seems to be the case from the feedback that we're getting is that people just want to get to know Billy and I more yeah. than anything else. So very often people are like, oh, we didn't realize that you were Mary and Pippin in real life. You guys are just hanging out in real life doing your thing. Of course, in every episode, we will touch upon Lord of the Rings because that's how Bills and I got to know each other. But we very often move off into different directions that people seem to love these like, sure. you know, different areas that we're going to. Mm. Um, yeah, it's really fun. I well, mean, you guys well, have a tremendous sense of humor together but also very unique individually you know right, oh, right. Cool. yeah right and he, you know he and i did walking with herb and yeah you know in the end it was it was well done man yeah i really liked it i loved your performance in that yeah i you really as well. did think you know you as well because I you had been know. you had been a guy that would have been almost like a um who is that guy that has never 
you know, that never really. He's always lot, there, guys. but never quite. Lee Westwood would be a guy yeah, like that. Yeah. You know, right, right, right. That, that I think oh, Darren Clark was a guy that Breck was. Breck Meyer. Breck and Meyer. Breck and Meyer. That's terrible. Oh, I know who's. No, oh. no disrespect to Breck and Meyer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Breck and Meyer, yeah. Stephen Tablowski. What do you call ne- Nearly Rans, right? Nearly Rans in England. Oh. If, if, if it's oh, a right, horse, right, right. If it's a horse in a race. They always come second. It's a mm. nearly ran. They they nearly won, but they just. But I just in. noticed you've got a gnome there. I never noticed. I've got a gnome, yeah. Yeah, because you've got a real kind of in that movie a real specific spiritual it, thing it was, going so, on. You know, that, they would. You know, somebody said to me, "I never considered you know George Lopez a yeah. messenger of God." I said, well, "Well, I think God has a lot of messengers <laughs> to deliver the message right, right, a lot right. of different ways." Yeah, yeah. You know, I I grew up uh, around a lot of. Um, my grandmother would call him Harry Krishna. She thought everybody that was bald, <laughs> wearing wearing a sash or wrapped around, no matter what color, that was just orange. It wasn't the USC Trojan colors, you know, uh, gold and and uh, and uh, the whatever the crimson and gold. Um, but everywhere I moved to in my life, they were always the Buddhists were always around. Right, yeah. Yeah. So then, kind of toward the end of the two thousands, I decided to look into it and. I've seen the Dalai Lama in person. I spoke at his 80th birthday party, and oh, wow. it's made me a much... I don't have that much anxiety or angst, or I'm not concerned about the things that have happened, or I'm not as worried about things that haven't happened. Right? Yeah, yeah. And it's to that. It's important. Yeah. I like to take different pieces from from different cultures and right. different religions and stuff, but it seems to me over the years that the, that the kind of tomes of practice more than anything else that I've taken have been Buddhists you know yes. the fact yeah. that they are kind to animals the fact that they care about each other the fact that they kind of want to make sure that you know other people are being treated in the same way that they are being treated which I guess is the golden rule for a lot of religions sure. but the Dalai Lama seems to be a, a pretty cool cat at the end yeah. they, hold no, they hold no judgment but I also know that when this Dalai Lama uh, passes that I believe that the Buddhists will not have a Dalai Lama in body for it'll be a while because they'll usually find somebody very young. I think the Dalai Lama was yeah. 15. Right. So when they do identify who is the 15th, they're going to kind of keep them under wraps because they think it might be a bit too much responsibility for someone young to sure, have. Sure, sure. So they'll wait till he gets a little bit older and then reveal. Wow. Himself, yeah, but, but this, one, this one's still going. Yeah, this one's yeah. still like release, it. like release his first album on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get it popping off before the show. He'll just re- he'll just keep recording until they're decided to release the first album. <laughs> I think it's probably a good idea. I mean, he was 15, 14, yeah. and then he had a brother with China that they tried to make his brother turn against him, and then right. the brother said, "Hey, man, they're they're coming to get you." <laughs> it's a lot of pressure, man. What an extraordinary yeah, life he's pressure. led. Yeah. And what an example he's set, you know, with all of those pressures and all of those, you know, chances where he could say, I'm done with this. I'm not going to do it right. for him to stick to that he discipline. What a fascinating human. And I met Sting uh, with the Dalai Lama in Boston and he, he said, I'm Sting. He didn't say I'm Gordon. OK, so he okay. even even in the light of the. <laughs> Love it. I said, oh, okay. I'm, Sticks to his I'm George. I'm Sting. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. You know, the Dalai Lama's right there. <laughs> yeah, he sees you. Though. He knows you. He oh, sees you. Good luck on your podcast. Thank this you, George. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. Great hanging out. Cheers, man. Thank you.